This channel is part of the History Hit Network. Scattered across this nation, there are places abandoned, boarded up, mysterious. I will unlock their doors and make them yield their secrets. From a people's palace of dreams, Whoa. that brought glamour and hope, <laughs> to a military hospital that was the birthplace of plastic surgery. That's a magnificent piece of work. It is a lovely thing. This defies all preconceptions and prejudices. He'd never done that operation before. Firing. To a vast Soviet war machine that brought us to the brink of World War III. Submarine warfare is hide and seek. This is just bristling with torpedoes. One after another could be fired. I've realized today how chillingly close we were to annihilation. To the beginning of the Great British Seaside Resort. It's all eerily silent now. How extensive is the sewer system here in Brighton? About 44 miles. This will be my hidden history of Britain. It was going to be a normal day, but that's before your house caught fire or you plowed into a pileup on the motorway or got embroiled in a riot. And then the emergency services had to cut you free or lead you to safety. And now you owe your life to someone that you'd never even met. This is the story of the extraordinary people who stand between us and chaos. I can always remember the screams and the harrowing noises. Between life and death. That little girl had been murdered by Myra Hindley. A breed apart. I can tell you every death would be too. What motivates these men and women to rush into danger when the rest of us are running away? We tried to calm people down. We knew it was going to be sad. To step in when our society tears itself apart. The next thing is we've got bricks and bottles coming towards us. Inside this building, I'll uncover the hidden history of our emergency services. Cells. This is where inquests were held into unexplained deaths. What kind of people are these brave rescuers? I hope to find the answers in this abandoned fire station. This is London Road Fire Station in central Manchester. For over 80 years, this citadel and its family of emergency workers stood guard over the city day and night. These are some of the men and women who served here. It's the last time they'll gather in this iconic building before it's redeveloped into luxury flats and offices. It's quite emotional for me here. Yes, I am the third generation who worked at this fire station. Third generation. Every Saturday, the lads on duty would scrub all the yard, all the balconies, everywhere, up and down. It was scrubbed and then jet with the hose pipe, and it was you could eat your dinner off the balconies. The stories of generations who dedicated themselves to public service can be found under this roof. This place never rested. Fire engines are coming in and out all night. You know, and when they come in, they're not quiet. It's not a case of Shh, somebody's asleep. Decommissioned in 1986, this fire station has been abandoned for 30 years. The first responders who worked here have said goodbye to London Road for the last time. Now the party's over, my search to unwrap their story can begin. What can this building tell me about the hidden history of Britain's emergency services? History Hit is a streaming platform that is just for history fans, with fantastic documentaries covering fascinating figures and moments in history from all over the world. 
Whether you're looking to dive into life and crime in Victorian London, the lessons that can be learned from the Middle Ages, or the forgotten history that deserves to be heard, History Hit has a documentary for you. Just a click away. We're committed to bringing history fans award-winning documentaries and podcasts that you can't find anywhere else. Sign up now for a 14-day free trial and Absolute History fans get 50% off their first three months. Just be sure to use the code ABSOLUTEHISTORY at checkout. Now what strikes me about the interior straight away is the size of it. I mean, it seems to occupy about half a city block. Here, these openings, I suppose, are where the fire tenders were kept. And here, a massive tower with, I don't know, eagles or mythical birds at the top. Oh! <laughs> Look what I found. What a beautiful object. Someone's left a fire engine behind. <laughs> So the fireman travelled inside with just this curtain and this just a crude tailgate keeping them in place. Completely crude. Absolutely basic. You imagine going to fight a fire in this thing. It must have been incredibly brave. The building has been mostly stripped of its contents but I'm hoping that enough clues survive for me to uncover its story. Ah, the poles that the firefighters could have descended upon in the event of an emergency. Dance, anyone? These poles suggest that I'm in the main fire engine room. I have an architect's drawing of the building, and here indeed are the bays where I am presently. Yes, appliance bays, and somewhere a photograph of that. So, that looks a fire car, but with an appliance in the background. And here, a fine set of fire engines, all lined up, looking very shiny. Britain's first fire brigades were set up by private insurance companies. The problem was that if a fire broke out in an uninsured building, it would be left to burn. In the 19th century, a series of deadly blazes across the country prompted cities to form their own brigades. Manchester built this station in 1906. Now, here we are lucky that decay has revealed the original tiles. They're very, very beautiful. Even the pillars have aspirations to be classical. These days, a fire station would occupy just one building, not an entire block. Why was this one built on such a vast scale? Well, I never. Look at this. An enormous double-height room, not what you expect to find in a fire station. It's kind of like a ballroom. Ah, gymnasium and hall. This was the gym, this is where the firemen kept fit. But everything was done on such a scale, wasn't it? London Road wasn't built just to be practical. It was clearly designed to be beautiful. I wonder why. The lovely tiles seem to run everywhere. And in contrast to many abandoned sites, natural light pours into this building. Ah, complete with fireplace. Somebody lived here. This was a kid's room. If there was any doubt that this was a children's room, here's a clue that will drum it into me. Hmm. It makes sense 
that firefighters should live close to the station that they serve. But to find that they lived on site with their families is a surprise. When I think of a fire station, I imagine drama and danger. It's not a place where I would expect to see children. Some of the things are sort of absolutely terrible. Retired firefighters Barry Pestle and Mike Berry will help me to understand what it was like to grow up in a fire station. Hello. Hello, Michael. Oh, welcome to our lovely abode. <laughs> Your lovely abode? Yeah. Yeah. If we'd known you were coming, we would have decorated a bit more. <laughs> Mike used to live here first. I was born here, not actually in the flat, but I was born at you know, that time. I spent the first 11 years of my life here. How extraordinary. What was it like living above a fire station? Oh, it's fantastic, because my dad was a fireman, obviously, otherwise you wouldn't have lived here, but... You had to be part of a firefighting family yes. to have a flat. Yes. 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 Yeah, it was great. It was like a little community. It was like a village, you know, like everybody looked after each other. And there was loads of kids. Yes. You know, there was kids almost in every flat. Do, do you normally have accommodation attached to a fire station like that? In the old, older days, certainly. Flats were provided for 32 firemen and their families at London Road. These unusual apartments were fitted with bells and sliding poles for quick response. During the last century, most British fire stations had residential quarters like these, so that firemen could be on alert around the clock to react to emergencies. Did you have to take great care? Because, I mean, obviously the, the appliances could come roaring out well, at any minute. Yeah, we, we wasn't allowed on the yard between the certain times. The recruits used to train on that yard every day. Because every time the appliances went out, the gates would be open and the gates would be shut, and you've seen the size Slightly of them. Noisy, yeah. So we used to wake you up, <laughs> shake the bed. They were very, very close to families. The kids would play on the wide balcony. Yeah. Football, cricket. Ball going over the, uh, into, onto the yard and shouting at the fireman, throw me ball back, you know, that sort of thing. <laughs> Which they would do. They were very good to us. Yeah. Following the family tradition, Mike and Barry went on to become firemen and served here at London Road. Do you remember moments of a great danger or even of tragedy? When you've had a, a child fatality, that's the, the worst, the worst ones, because you don't get over them for a while. Because you just relate it to your own kids and then, you know. I can tell you every death I've been to mm, and every yeah, death I've investigated. Them, yeah. Remember it so clearly. I'm getting a sense of a distinctive community of tight-knit families where death and danger were never far away. That's the host tower there. Sometimes if the firemen left this building open, if they go out to a fire call, they forget to lock it, you know, because they were rushing. And I'd go up there as a kid, right up to the top, and there's a drop there of over 100 foot. Because oh that's just where they used to dry the hose after they'd washed it. Is that what it was designed for? That's what it was designed for, yeah, just a hose tower. I would have thought that a fire station would be a pretty testosterone-filled place, kind of strictly men only. So it's a pleasant surprise to find that this courtyard and this balcony turned out to be an ideal adventure playground for kids. I've discovered how London Road was home to a remarkable fellowship dedicated to saving lives. Its scale makes sense now that I know that this place housed entire families. But how would this community hold up when its city was engulfed in disaster on an overwhelming scale? These two firemen were killed holding this. That was pretty well all that was found. London Road in Manchester was the hidden home of heroes who shielded the rest of us from death and disaster. The firemen and their families who lived here were special people. What clues can this extraordinary fire station reveal to help me uncover their story? If I drew you my impression of a fire station, it would be like a large double garage with a tower on the side for the firefighters to train. I wouldn't show you terracotta tiles, pillars, carved grotesque animal heads like gargoyles and semi-naked human figures. Of course, Manchester became, during the 19th century, one of the great manufacturing hubs dominating the world with its exports of cotton from its mills. And I suppose, at the beginning of the 20th century, even the fire station had to reflect in its grandeur the pride of the city. 
But Manchester's industrial success brought danger. When the Second World War broke out, its factories became a prime target for German bombers. Night after night, the people of London Road were called upon to save the city from fires started by Luftwaffe bombs. Incendiary bomb raids, buildings set on fire, just complete pandemonium, really. Bob Bonner joined the London Road Brigade when he was just 16. His father, Robert, was a fireman during the war. Bob and his team have brought along a World War II engine to help me to understand the challenges his father faced. What a beautiful engine. Tell me, tell me about that. Delivered here in 1940, just before the Blitz. Had a real baptism of fire and then spent the rest of its career at this fire station. So and it has both a pump and a ladder, right? It has a pump and what we call a wheeled escape ladder. So the whole ladder comes off and it's on wheels. And these are the original rescue ladders that go back to the Victorian times. Which, which uniform is this? What vintage? Well, this vintage, this lasted over 100 years, this uniform. It was introduced by the Victorians in use, in use well into the 1960s. Oh, well, it's a great honour to be able to uh, wear this even for a few moments. The fabric of this uniform yeah, offers nice barely fits. any fire protection. And we'll need a belt with your axe on. Pull that round tight, Michael, or I'll give you a lift. OK, one right. more thing, and then you will look like a fireman. Thank you. Shall we mount, as we say? Let's Shall mount. mount? Okay. In those days, there was no formal training, and firemen learnt their skills on the job. But nothing could prepare them for the horrors of war. Just before Christmas 1941, the Luftwaffe delivered its most devastating raid yet. More than 400 tonnes of high explosives were dropped in just two nights, in what was known as the Christmas Blitz. What would Bob's father have been thinking as he headed into the blazing city. Depends very much, you know, which seat you're sitting in. If you're in charge, you're thinking of all sorts of things and pre-planning. If you're the driver, you've got your own responsibilities. You're thinking about getting there the best way, getting your crew there safely, and what you might have to do yourself when you get there. So there's quite a lot goes through your mind in those four or five minutes. More than 600 civilians lost their lives during the bombings. But London Road was a bastion of hope, as its firemen fought inferno after inferno, night after night, to save the city from annihilation. How did the disaster of war touch the people who lived here? It had a massive impact on the fire service. First of all, it was expanded about 10 times with hundreds of volunteers. Once the air raids started in earnest, there was incendiary bomb raids, larger fires than they'd ever experienced. The Christmas Blitz of 1940 was the big one. Two nights of severe bombing, December 22nd and 23rd. And in that, those two nights, most of the damage, most of the casualties occurred, the losses. And for the fire brigade, it was pandemonium. Uh, have with me this, this is what we call a branch pipe, which is the bit that the fireman holds at the end of the hose. Yeah. Two firemen in Old Trafford were directing this onto a fire where incendiary bombs are set a church alight. The Germans came back with a second air raid and dropped high explosive bombs on the fire. So these two firemen were killed, sadly. Uh, Roy Skelton and, and William Vera were holding this branch pipe when basically it was blown up. Uh, and sadly, they, that was pretty well all that was found. It is very poignant. And it brings it home. Those were two of 30 Manchester firefighters who died in the Blitz. The loss of life must have been devastating, but the people of London Road soldiered on to protect the city. The Blitz reduced many streets in this city to smoking rubble, and there were numerous civilian casualties. Many firefighters died too, because in Manchester, as in the rest of Britain, this was their finest hour. The fire service emerged from this brutal war damaged but undefeated. Determined to learn from the tragedy, the profession in Britain was transformed. Equipment was standardised. Women joined the force. And for the first time, firefighters had to train rather than simply learn on the job.
These are very small rooms. I mean, this is more or less like a cell. Ah. Communal bathrooms, communal lavatories. In 1948, just three years after the war, London Road founded the country's premier firefighting school. Recruits flocked from all over the world to gain from this fire station's hard-won expertise. I'm guessing that each of these little cells is actually single man's accommodation. The trainees reflected a changing Britain. People like Sam Smart, whose parents settled here from the Caribbean in the 1950s. I did three months training here, and we lived here. So yeah, this has got a lot of memories for me. Sam served for 30 years as a firefighter, battling more than 9,000 blazes. Yep. He's going to give me a taste of a fireman's training. Get into these. It's very heavy pair of trousers with braces. This uniform is a far cry from the last one I had on. Ready for training. Hello. How are you, Paul? You all right? How, how do you find this kit? It's quite, uh, it's quite difficult to work in, isn't it? It can be, but once you get used to it, you'll be all right. And it does offer us some protection, does yeah, it? Yeah, it offers you a lot of protection. What do you remember about your training? One of the things we used to do, we used to have to do a height test. The instructor used to put an L and an R, the letter L and the letter R on the bottom of your feet. He'd then ask you to walk to the top of the tower, the three top windows, the ledge above it, You'd stand on the edge of the tower, like that's the edge of the tower there, and you couldn't go till he could see Eleanor at the bottom. Once he saw Eleanor at the bottom, you went. Were, were, you, were you scared? Yeah. 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 I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. yeah. Any fireman who tells you he's not scared is a liar. <laughs> Firefighters need to work at extreme heights and in confined spaces while handling challenging and hazardous equipment. Wrangling the hose is a critical part of the job. So the first thing we're going to do is we'll get one of these. Now, there is a certain way of running them out, yeah? Yeah. If you hold it up like that, yeah. it'll unfold itself. OK, great. Yeah? Let me try that. This is yeah. not light. Yeah, so if you just carry on walking in that direction, right, just hang on. Hold it up, hold it up. There we go. Perfect, yeah? Yeah, it's unrolling itself. Right. OK. You now want something to extinguish the fire, a branch. And as you can see, that branch will go in the end yeah, of sure. that hose. Just goes in there, does it? Yeah. And you lay the click, that's yes. it clicked. You'll yeah, see clicked. now, we're going to be aiming for that corner of the building. Yes. Your stance is going to be with your left foot forward and your right foot back. Yeah, that's it. And where are you going My to be? My stance oh. is going to be behind you same way. All power! Here we go. Right, so now you open it to what you want. Turn the end and, and you'll see what, yeah, go on, keep doing it and you'll see what you get, yeah. Bit more power! This is a medium-sized hose, but it blasts hundreds of litres of water per minute. It takes all my strength to control it. If mishandled, the pressure could easily whip you into the air or off a ladder. Factor in flames, smoke, fumes, and panicking victims, and you begin to understand how extraordinary is a firefighter's expertise. Even without the fire, that was pretty exhilarating. Wow, the force of the jet, enormous. It's not just about individual ability. Each person must synchronize with the team in the face of danger. During that workout with a fire hose, although there was no danger because there was no fire, I was very aware of how dependent I was on the other firefighter, which I suppose accounts for the extraordinary sense of comradeship that there is between them all. And they would need that to survive the worst horrors. I can see just about how you train a firefighter to brave the flames and fumes, but to encounter bodies in a burning building. 
How do you prepare for that? Pick the casualties up, place them into the sheets, fold them up. In 1979, 21-year-old Paul Miller came to train at London Road. Just two days after finishing his course, Manchester experienced its worst fire since World War II. I was part of the crews that attended the Woolworths incident. Tuesday the 8th of May 1979, a taxi firm called 999 to report fumes coming from the Woolworths building. Crews arrived to find billowing smoke and people desperately calling for help from the windows. Around 500 were trapped inside. How bad did the Woolworth incident turn out to be? The officer in charge made it pumps 10 straight away. So Meaning you needed 10 engines? 10 engines straight away. The deadly blaze swept through six floors of the department store. It was a baptism of fire for a man who'd just finished his training. You're conditioned to do exactly what you're told to do. And that's basically all I did was whatever the officer told me to do, I did. Straight away got the ladders off where there were some ladies trapped in the wages room and the windows actually had iron bars on so they couldn't actually get out. I can always remember the, the screams and the harrowing noises they made. The chap cut the, um, the bars with a reciprocating saw to allow the women to be rescued. How many people perished in that fire? Ten. It was ten fatals. We had to go up into the smoke, take one of the casualties, place them in the salvage sheet, and bring them down to ground floor level. Had you seen a corpse in your life before? No. It was a bit overwhelming at first, obviously, um, to see that many uh, casualties. And the conditions you've described, flames, smoke? Yes. It was the fumes that uh, actually killed the casualties. It wasn't fire-related deaths. It was uh, toxic smoke. Forged in fire and tested by disaster, Paul and his colleagues saved countless lives. How did London Road firefighters cope knowing they could face death each time they answered a call? They used to come back and they used to be so distressed. We were their counsellors. I've come to London Road Fire Station in central Manchester to uncover hidden stories of Britain's first responders. In this building, there was forged a culture of bravery and selflessness as its rescuers battled through the 20th century's most terrible events. But how did this community cope with the ever-present threat of death? Linda Bonner, Gloria Gaffney, and Lynn Bairstow worked at London Road's nerve centre, the control room. There used to be four watches yeah. and four girls on each watch. And we used to work um, a nine hour day shift and a 15 hour night shift. Well, I've watched, we were awake. All awake night. all yes. the time. Yes. <laughs> all the time. Yeah. The fire women took each emergency call and dispatched the fire engines. Some of the firefighters went and saw very distressing things. Yes. Had horrible experiences. Mm -hmm. Did you interact with them at all after that? Yes, we did. Mm -hmm. I remember one incident. It was the Christmas period, and uh, there was a fire and fatalities with children. Children were brought out. I think there were three. And um, that was awful because the fireman said that as he was carrying out, he had got children of a similar mm -hmm. age at home. They used to come and sit. We used to give them tea, and they used to talk out their problems. Mm -hmm. They never used to take their problems home. Mm -hmm. We were their counsellors. As well as providing vital psychological support, these women masterminded operations. You always had to get the address, Com the yeah. number, mm -hmm. the nearest main road and the locality. And uh, they would say, oh, I don't know. The only other thing we could say, where is the nearest, nearest public house? Yes, Do you we remember? used to go yeah. on a public, public, public house. house. <laughs> yeah, because there are a lot and, There's a lot, and yeah. everyone knows where they are. Yes. Yeah. 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 You then had to keep in touch with the fire engines you'd turned out on the radio so you didn't lose them. You used to have a big uh, board with a map on behind us and we used to have to physically move uh, pins that represented the fire engines. And when yeah. they got there, uh, if it was a problem, it came back on the radio, persons reported. Or if they wanted more pumps, make pumps five, make pumps eight. Did you, did you find this stressful? You've got someone 
obviously very stressed at the other end, very anxious. I mean, if, if we, we lost yeah. it, it would have been no good for anybody. No. If it's affected, yeah, I think that was the time to give up. What I took from meeting the control room firewomen is that they were treated as absolute equals, key colleagues, and for the firefighters, kindred spirits upon whom they could unburden themselves of all that they had seen and endured. London Road was both a fire station and a community. Within this building, there grew structures that provided emotional support for everyone who lived and worked here. Because here, death was inescapably a part of life. A waiting room such as you would find in a railway station. Ha! Not a railway station, but a courtroom. What a beautiful room. Carved oak panelling everywhere. Period lighting, stained glass windows. Lists of names. Deceased occupation needed thanks. Deceased occupation. This is a coroner's court. This is a coroner's court. This is where inquests were held into unexplained deaths. And it sits in the same building as the fire service because after all, all of them are macabrely linked. It makes sense that where there was unexplained or sudden death, there was a need to deliver justice. Aha! A rather grand double-doored entrance and a beautifully tiled lobby. This is obviously intended for the public, this beautiful grill. So this part of the building is something quite separate. A service hatch. So obviously some bureaucratic transaction went on over here. Blackboard. <laughs> Cells with benches and lavatories. This is a police station. So the prisoners were brought here. They were registered and up on the blackboard, they wrote the names of the people who were in the cells. I can understand why there would be a coroner's court in this building, but why a police station? The fire brigade and the police at one time were one under the watch committee. 89-year-old Dennis Wood served in the police for 25 years. What was your relationship with the fire station? Did you have much of a relationship? We'd associate often in uh, fires which were fatal fires. What's your memory of this place? It was a very busy station. People were being arrested and brought in and charged, invariably put into one of these little places. Fires were not the only horrors faced by police officers at London Road. What experiences stand out in your career? The, I think that it stands out in my mind. I was told to go around to a, a house and uh, where there was a little girl missing from home and her mother was distraught and uh, that little girl had been taken from a fairground and murdered later on 
by Myra Henley and Brainer. This police station covered Gorton, the area where Myra Henley and Ian Brady committed their heinous crimes. Some time later, one of my policemen said, well, I'm, I've been going out with her, he said, but um, just trying to sell my old van to her. The van which she bought, we know she used in the horrible things that she took part in. In their struggle to protect us, the emergency services of London Road faced terrors that most of us could never imagine. I read the horror on Dennis's face after all these years of even a brush with the perpetrator of some of the most appalling murders ever committed. Hinley and Brady buried the bodies of the children that they murdered on Saddleworth Moor. Three years later, the police from this station helped to bring them to justice. They were part of a network of officers patrolling the streets of Manchester to uncover the killers. Policing was all about the beat. You had to walk your beat. During his 30 years with the police, Mike McCulloch worked on the Manchester IRA bombing and the Harold Shipman murder case. Here we have London Road Station. There's the fire brigade. And here's your beat. This whole section here, you would have to cover. And you've got about an hour to do that. And you would start here, and you would work your way through. And every part of this, you would know. So it's not a matter of walking the perimeter. It's oh, a matter no. of walking through all the nooks and crannies. Oh, yeah. It's a very, very difficult job. And it's also time bound. So as you went along, you actually knew every building. You probably knew lots and lots of people. You would know all the people. You would know every building. You are the security system of every one of these buildings. Do you, do you think it was an effective system? Yes, because a police officer was here. The public would know they are here. Run for the constable was an effective means. You know, you could find a constable. They would know where they were. So that worked. What kind of crimes were they having to investigate? This whole area, the warehouse, of course, warehouses bring goods, goods brings customers and thieves. So the police have got their work cut out. Just like London Road's firefighters, the police dedicated their lives to protecting us from danger. But in the 1980s, as social and political unrest swept the country, the emergency services would be brought into direct conflict with members of the public. No matter what goes on, you're in the middle and you don't have any control over it. I've discovered the surprising story of the emergency teams who worked and lived in this hidden citadel. Proudly and bravely, they shielded us from death and disaster. But political upheaval and social unrest would bring the men and women of London Road into conflict with the people they protected. Unemployment in the 1980s helped to trigger riots in British cities. It was a bit surreal because we'd never been in that situation. Former London Road firefighter Albert Gilbert was caught up in the Moss Side riots. It was a bit eerie, to be honest with you, because got these shops with the windows put through them. And we started fighting the fire and a lad came along and said, oh, it's all kicking off. You better get out of here. Well, what do you mean? He said, oh, he said, there's hundreds of them sort of thing around at the police station. And he said, I've warned you, I told you, he said, you better go. The next thing is we got bricks and bottles coming towards us. We had a brick put through the, the, the window of our fire appliance. And the ladder, he went for the windscreen, but ill-judged because we were moving at some speed. Did um, firefighters have any kind of sympathy for the um, rioters, do you think? There was an empathy with them because there was this large amount of unemployment. And in particular with them, and you sort of went, yeah, it got to a boiling point. You've got the authorities, you've got the mob. Where's the fire brigade? In the middle. They've always been in the middle. No matter what goes on, you're in the middle. And you don't have any control over it. 
That, that's what you signed up to do. Save life, save property, render humanitarian services. And humanitarian services could cover a multitude of sins, including riots. A new era for the fire service brought big changes. Large residential fire stations were replaced with smaller buildings in multiple locations. For almost a century, this building and others like it nurtured a culture of bravery and sacrifice. In 1986, it closed its doors for the last time. The grand era of this citadel of heroes was over. London Road stood forgotten for nearly 30 years until developers Allied London bought the site in 2015. Their plan is to convert it into a combination of hotels, apartments and offices. Rochelle Silverstein is their associate director. In future, when this is uh, residential, when it's got restaurants, uh, when it's got spas and all these things, and an old firefighter comes back, Hopefully, they will see how sort of lovingly we've restored it and we've taken our time over it. We are meticulously going around the building, documenting every single finish, every single window, to see what we can keep and what we can bring back to life. We've taken lots of, of histories from people that lived here and um, we want to document that in one place if we can. The men and women of London Road left behind hidden traces of the lives lived here. A team of artists and researchers is saving them for posterity. By preserving remnants of historic wallpaper, building a virtual reality experience at the station, creating portraits on antique surfaces, and overlaying archive on modern day photographs, these artists will help to keep the story of this building alive. fragments of things, the trace of a signature, perhaps a little hairpin found on the floor. One of the artists taking part is Harriet Redfern. Have you felt drawn to the building? Yes, definitely. Um, my dad's a firefighter, so there's sort of that personal connection. I'm really interested in the signatures that I found around the fire station underneath the wallpapers. Harriet traces the graffiti that she's uncovered to create a glass sculpture. You can have a go if you like. Now, I'm rather getting into this. I'm going to start curving around yeah. here. Is that more or less right? Yeah. So it's just sort of getting a feel for the material, the wire, and how you would use the tools with that as well. Yeah, so you're pretty, pretty close. I'm yeah. not going to claim that's brilliant, but it's... Uh, it's pretty close, it's though. It's getting there. Yeah. I can see how you do it. I yeah. can't emulate how you do it, <laughs> but I can see how you do it. Um, why is this building so special then? I think because through this building we can sort of access stories about community and I feel that community is really important and it's perhaps something that we are maybe losing in contemporary society. These remnants of the lives lived here will help a new generation to understand the extraordinary legacy of this place and the hundreds of men and women who lived and worked here will never forget London Road. I did three months training here and we lived up there. So yeah, this has got a lot of memories for me. It was great. It was like a little community. It was like a village, you know, like everybody looks after each other. Policing was all about the beat. You had to walk your beat. They used to talk out their problems. We were their counsellors. I have uncovered a citadel, a walled town within the city, secret from the world. There's a courthouse and a police station. But for firefighters, this was not only their workstation, but where they brought up their kids and drank and danced and played. Between their hair-raising missions, the blazes and the rescues, they laughed together, building up the comradeship needed for the next call out. The plan is to convert it into a hotel and flats, but it will forever be a monument to a community, a family. 
founded on mutual trust and courage.